All right, remember when you log in, when you come into the class, go into the chat box and give me your name and say here. So I have that as a log that you are here. It's just about 12.30, so I'll get started. Uh, first, I want to ask, are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions for me? Let's see, no's. Lots of no's. So if you don't have a question for me, make sure you put in no, then I know you're still here. Because remember, I'm saving these chats now, so that's a proof that you're still around when I ask, do you have any questions, yes or no? You know, and now if I ask a yes or no question and you don't answer, I'm wondering whether you're still here or not. Saying no or saying yes uh, shows me that you are still here and in the class. And remember, those of you who are signing in, uh, in the last four or five minutes, make sure that you put your name in the chat box and say here. And that way, when I save the chat box, I'll have all those, and I know that you guys were here. I can mark you off as present. All right. This is where we ended last time, talking about some of the terms of the neuron and its uh, neural impulse. And we talked about the fact that at a resting potential, the neuron is at negative 70 millivolts. And then when it fires off, uh, moving the ions back and forth through its membrane to become more positive, it goes up to positive 30, which is a 100 millivolt change. And when that change uh, gets down to the terminal buttons, the terminal buttons spit out a whole bunch of neural transmitters, which are basically chemicals that will act upon either the dendrite of the next neuron or the organ or the gland or the muscle, whatever it is that it's trying to uh, act upon. So it goes from negative 70 to plus 30 millivolts, and then it has to return back to negative 70 millivolts before it can fire off again. So there's this resting potential, which is really about one, one, one thousandth of a second because it can fire off a thousand times a second. So it's pretty fast in normal thinking, how we think about life. But for a neuron, uh, that's, it's, it's slow. A neuron is at the highest it can go, a thousand uh, beats per second. And I brought up the fact that, well, our ears hear more than a thousand beats per second. And if a neuron can only register a thousand beats per second, how is it that we hear above a thousand and we'll find out when we get to the perception and sensation chapter. So the synapse is the space in between the terminal buttons of the neuron and whatever else it's about to impinge upon, uh, either dendrites of another neuron or, a, or um, some other organ of the body. And the synaptic transmission, the part that goes, because electricity doesn't transfer from, through the, the gap, Instead, it's chemical transmission through the gap, and that comes from neurotransmitters, and those bind to the cell on the other side and either cause a muscle to contract or to expand, to relax, or for another uh, neuron to fire off, or even to stop the next neuron from firing off, because there are some chemicals we'll see in just a minute that are inhibiting chem chemicals that stop neurons from transmitting. We'll see why we need that in just a minute. Of course, you don't want your, I'll tell you now, you don't want your brain to be 100% active. That's called an epileptic seizure. So you want the brain to have some time off. And people say that we have a, a brain that only uses 10% of the brain. That's not true. We use 100% of the brain, but only 10% of the time, thankfully, because 100% would be epilepsy. So the neurotransmitters um, are these chemicals that the body produces, and they are, uh, there are many of them. These are just seven of them, and I picked these seven for a purpose. Um, most of you will recognize what they do, at least, and understand how they work. But the interesting aspect of all these neurotransmitters is that they are not in every single neuron. A neuron produces a specific type of neurotransmitter, and when it gets activated, it releases that specific type of neurotransmitter. 
how does the neuron end up in the brain in the right place producing the right amount of neurotransmitter and the right kind of neurotransmitter. And of course, not all of us are exactly the same. Development is on a spectrum. Some are much better than other people in their brain patterns and what's happened to them during their life during development, especially for the first four years, including in the womb. And everybody's not the same. Some people are a little different than other people. And we're all a little different, but we're all very, very similar. I'll show in just a little while. Um, we are all humans, all of us, the same race. There's no such thing as race unless you want to call the human race. So these chemicals, let's start with uh, dopamine first. Uh, dopamine starts in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra. It produces sensations of pleasure and rewards and influences our learning and attention and is also used by the central nervous system in voluntary movements, voluntary movements. If you have enough dopamine in your system, then you are able to think about holding your head still and watching my videos. But if you don't have enough dopamine, your head is moving around, your body is jerking and moving, and that's called Parkinson's disease, where too little of dopamine causes Parkinson's disease. And then if you have too much, then your brain's really active and you have schizophrenia. But schizophrenia, um, well, first of all, substances that affect schizophrenia are cocaine, amphetamines, Ritalin, and alcohol. And we'll see alcohol a lot on these lists. Alcohol is not something that it should be um, consumed very often. And of course, as, as you've heard, everything in moderation, but alcohol is really bad for the system. So <clears throat> there are drugs that actually increase dopamine levels in the brain, and they're made for very specific purposes to help people with very specific issues. And when they're given that particular drug, their dopamine level can increase. Now, we know about these now, and we don't use them very much anymore, but when they were first being developed, they were given to people to help them with a specific condition. The dopamine in their body increased, and they had schizophrenic symptoms because of dopamine level. But the schizophrenic symptoms were very specifically caused by the drug that they were being given for another problem. And yet, because they, were, they had schizophrenic symptoms, now their medical file says that they're schizophrenic. And once you have schizophrenia risk written on your medical record, it is nearly impossible to get it off, even if it's their fault that you have schizophrenia uh, for only the portion of time that you're taking the drug. And then when you're off the drug, your dopamine level will return to normal and you won't be schizophrenic anymore, but they keep it on your record. And that's wrong, that's just wrong. But we're fighting that fight for years. So the problems with the imbalance and the substances that affect it, we've just gone over. So let's look at serotonin instead next. Regulate sleep and dreaming, moods, pain, aggression, appetite, and sexual pleasure. So too little of it is linked to depression. Now here's another example of where a biological event in your body, production of serotonin, is directly correlated to a psychological error. So certain anxiety orders also, too little of it, and too little of it also, obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> more of the, um, well, anxiety, the number one, number one psychological issue, anxiety. Number two, depression. So let's, uh, Prozac, I'm sure you've heard of Prozac and drugs like Prozac that help with people um, that, <clears throat> that have some issues, pathologies, and hallucinogen, hallucinogenics will also affect serotonin as well. Uh, hallucinogenics, obviously LSD, but also marijuana and other hallucinogens as well. Norepinephrine is produced in the reticular formation. We'll talk about the reticular formation in a little bit. It is a piece of the back of the, of the neck um, in the spine, the spinal area, the, the, the part of the brain that pushes down 
called the hind brain into the spine. And it's a very interesting issue um, that reticular formation keeps you awake and wakes you up when you're sleeping. It sends out a signal when it's time for you to wake up. And if it, at any time during the day, if it shuts down for some reason, you fall asleep. There's, you cannot stop yourself. It just happens. And that's called narcolepsy. So narcolepsy is um, part of the problem of the reticular formation. Uh, it controls the autonomic nervous systems, heart rate, which we don't think about, uh, sexual responsiveness, stress, vigilance, appetite, and as I said, sleep. The problems with imbalance are high blood pressure and depression. And I'm sure you've heard the term tricyclic antidepressants or beta blockers. These are some of the drugs that people get to help them with their high blood pressure. That's norepinephrine. Acetylcholine works on the muscles of the body. It's primary transmitter used by the efferent neurons to carry messages from the central nervous system to the rest of the body and involved in some kinds of learning and memory. Now, there, the, it's, it works on the muscles. Right? Acetylcholine allows your muscles to contract and then relax. So certain muscular disorders are part of the problems of having the wrong amount of acetylcholine. And Alzheimer's disease has also been connected with too much or too little acetylcholine. The substances that affect it, nicotine, that's like smoking, right? nicotine is in the cigarettes. Uh, the reason why people are addicted to cigarettes is because of the nicotine, not the smoke and the tar and other things that destroy your lungs, but they need the nicotine because they're addicted to it. Nicotine and caffeine, nicotine and caffeine are just as addicting as cocaine. We'll talk about those in another lecture as well. Uh, and black widow ver venom, venom. Uh, oh, the botulism toxin. Botulism is when food goes bad, curare, uh, atropine, and black widow venom. The black widow venom is kind of interesting because it blocks acetylcholine and keeps the acetylcholine from working on the muscles. So if you, it's like your muscles just go loose. Your heart is a muscle. And so that is the reason why black widow venom is so dangerous. Now, as an adult, I have a large volume of blood. And so a bite from a black widow will not be as dangerous to me as it will to a young child who's bitten, who has a very small um, volume of blood, and that black widow venom is a, a much more intense portion of their volume, and so it'll kill a child easily. So that's acetylcholine. The GABA is a very strange uh, neurotransmitter. GABA stops things from working. That's its purpose. Its purpose is to shut stuff down, shut it down. It's an inhibition neurotransmitter, and it is the most prevalent of all of the inhibition transmitters in the neural nervous system. It's as much as a thousand times more prevalent than any of the other inhibitory types. That's why I don't talk about all the different types. Um, we, this is not a biology class, so I'm giving you a overview of psychology and biology. So the problems with imbalance of GABA, too little of it can cause epilepsy because it shuts things down. It shuts down the neurons. It keeps them from firing. It's inhibitory process. If you don't have those GABA, too little of it, then there are nerves, neurons, that are going to be firing off when they shouldn't be firing off, which then fire off. They, they cause 10 other ones to fire off. Those 10 cause 100 other ones to fire off. Those 100 cause 1,000 more to fire off. And so you have epilepsy because lack of GABA. Uh, but too much of it, epilepsy, insomnia, and tremors. Substances that affect it are barbiturates, which also put you to sleep, tranquilizers uh, like Valium and Librium, and also alcohol again. And we'll talk very specifically about alcohol later. Glutamine uh, is the exact opposite of GABA. 
Now, did, have any of you ever heard of the of monosodium glutamate? Monosodium glutamate. Are any of you allergic to monosodium glutamate? Okay. Nobody seems to be allergic to it. I am. And I had one person in the last class that was. And um, we, I say allergic because they don't like to say we're allergic to it. They say we're reactive to it. What's the difference, right? So uh, this is the primary exciting neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It's involved in learning and memory. But too much of it, because it's exciting the system, too much of it causes migraines. And I'm sure a lot of you have migraines and you know what they are. And also seizures because your, your brain, like a epileptic, your brain is too excited because it has too much glutamine in it. I don't have migraines. Uh, what I have, the cluster headache is like somebody hitting you in the head with a frying pan. And oh my gosh, it hurts, but only for a second or two. But if I'm carrying anything while I'm getting hit by that frying pan, I'm dropping it. It's, it's on the floor. Um, it hurts. It's a bad thing. But then migraines are probably worse because migraines just last and last and last. Any of you have migraines? Women seem to have migraines more often than men do. Some of you do have migraines. And it might be because of glutamine, too much glutamine in your system. Uh, but substances that will affect it are MSG, especially found in Chinese food. MSG is basically a salt. Our tongues actually respond to monosodium glutamate, just like our tongues respond to salt. And so it makes food taste better, which is why it's in Chinese food, because cat really doesn't taste good by itself cooked. So <laughs> I'm kidding you. If they don't cook and eat cats in the United States, you can't find that in the United States. Now, right here in, in Elizabeth City, we had a Chinese restaurant that was shut down. They were serving monkey. And they didn't serve it to us, the normal customer. They were serving it to their Chinese customers because Chinese customers are used to eating monkey in China. But it's illegal here in the United States. I don't even know how they got it here to the United States. But they were serving monkey and they were shut down. It is true that people eat different things. Uh, we tend to eat cows, but in India, the country of India, cows are sacred. They do not eat cows. We don't eat dogs. There are friends and there are pets, but in China, they eat dog. Um, now, there's a new rule. Just within the last few months, the Chinese government has determined that it is illegal now to eat dog. So. Who knows how that will change because people are so used to it, it might take years before it actually goes into effect. Also, PCP will affect glutamine. Uh, but what happens when I, eat, when I eat something with MSG in it, I'm getting more glutamine than I should. Well, too much causes migraines. Sure enough, if I eat too much glutamate, uh, monosodium glutamate, it affects my brain and my head hurts like crazy and I start sweating. And if I eat too much of the foods that I'm not supposed to eat, which I'm, I react to a number of different foods, then I start to hear voices in my head. And the first time that happened, believe me, I went to the doctor right away. It's like, what is going on? And they found out that I was reactive to a number of foods that I ate every single day and I can remember going all the way back to my youth, very young, where I had issues with food. And that particular type of problem never occurred, but I was, as my dad used to say, I was spastic. And I'm pretty sure it was because of some of the stuff I was eating back then. And we'll talk more about that in another lecture. The last one is endorphins. Endorphins are very interesting because they're one of the reasons why we get addicted to substances. They are responsible for our pleasure sensations and for the control of pain. You have a certain amount of endorphins in your system. Some have more, some have less. But let's say this is a normal amount of endorphins in your system. And here's the, this is normal, and it goes up and down, but it stays within this range. Okay? 
Um, and when something happens to you that causes pain, it increases the endorphins a little bit, but it can't increase it too much. Your body can only do so much, and you're in massive amounts of pain, and so they give you opids like um, opium, heroin, morphine. They used to. Today, today it's morphine that they give you, but uh, they give you the morphine in order to help with the endorphins because they can't, they can only do so much, and then the a morphine comes in and oh good the endorphins don't have to work as hard and you're living off of the morphine but doctors give you a month supply of morphine at a time and in a week and a half your pain level is much reduced but you're still taking the morphine and so your endorphins go well I don't need to be here anymore and they're gone they just stop because the morphine is doing all it needs to do. They don't need, you don't need this endorphin system anymore. When the opiates come down out of your blood system and start when you, you know, one month later, as your they start to get rid of your body starts to metabolize the last of the morphine and it goes down below where your normal level is for what you consider to feel good you feel miserable because the morphine is down here now. And your endorphin level can't come right back like that. So what do you need? You need another hit of morphine or opium or some other type of drug that you become addicted to because you need that extra kick to stay above where you're normal, you feel good. So you need to take people off of morphine, not just stop them so that it drops down below really fast, but so that it drops slowly down. And that way the endorphin system says, oh, I guess I need to come back online to pull back up and start working again. And that's how we get addicted to a drug. Is That's one of the ways we get addicted to the drug. That's endorphins. Uh, low amounts can cause depression. Here's a, a perfect relationship again between the biological and psychological problems. Chronic unexplained pain. Now my, my wife must have a large amount of endorphins in her system because she, if she says she's in pain, I would probably have already passed out from the pain that she's feeling. Uh, I feel pain really fast. And like I can walk on the sand at the beach and I immediately know I'm putting my socks on or something else because it's too hot. And she can just walk right along and her feet are burning and she doesn't even, it doesn't affect her until she, you know, tries to do something else, put her shoes back on, then it hurts. And a low tolerance for pain. And then opiate use produces the lowered levels of these endorphins. You try to get off of whatever it is that you're addicted to, codeine or something else hydrocodone is the new thing um, so if you're just back and forth back and forth so that you circle around this normal and what you where you feel good back and forth and if you get off of it you start to lower down off of it the number one time when addicts have a problem getting getting through their addiction or going back on to their addiction is six months if you can make it to the seventh month, you've made a big leap because the sixth month is when all this, whatever it was that you were trying to use this like alcohol um, to get through and the endorphins have died because you're using this other thing that affects the endorphins, um, at six months, all that comes right back to you again. And you have to, head, you have to face it head on. And that's why it's good to have a therapist around um, when you're trying to get off of whatever drug that you're addicted to. We'll talk about addiction in another lecture. Are there any questions about any of those before I head on to the energy requirements and sizes of brains? No, 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 no. Okay. And remember, if you haven't already said so, your name in the chat box and say here, that's your record that you were here. The brain and energy requirements. 
the weight of the brain, the human brain, varies from about 1200, 1198 average in females to about 1336 in males. There is a very big difference in the average size of male and female brains. We are different. We are not the same. Lots of people like to say that we are, but we have very big differences between males and females. It's about 2% of our body weight, our brain is. It's not the weight, however, that determines its energy needs. It's the number of neurons because a uh, one billion neurons requires about six calories per day to survive. And we have 86 billion of them in our brain when we're born, so we need 512 calories just for our brain to survive. And, of course, a normal uh, number of calories average for a human being is 2,000 calories a day, which means a quarter of those calories that we need every day is going to the brain. 25% goes to the brain, its energy needs. If you have a bigger brain, then you need more energy. And if you have uh, a bigger body, you need more energy also. And so because we can only consume so much during the day, we have a limit to how much we can actually eat. Even if we just keep eating, 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 there's going to be some sort of a give and take here between how much your how many calories your brain needs and how many your body needs and how much you can ingest every single day. So every animal has a particular uh, amount that they need to ingest because of the, their weight and because of their brain, the number of brain uh, cells they have. So let's look at that because I've got a listing of them. Uh, so the human brain is not the largest by mass. Actually, a blue whale has one of the biggest brains, but his body is so huge, it's very small compared, like a peanut, compared to if they brought it down to the size of a human being, his brain would be the size of a peanut. What we can do to, turn, to determine how many brain cells are in a brain is, of course, the brain has to be dead. We can take an animal's brain. We can take away all of the cellular material except for the nucleus. We can dissolve the neurons and all the material that is associated with it except for the nucleus. And then we can count how many nuclei there are left over, and that's how many brain cells there were. And that's how we know that we have 86 billion of them. They take uh, people who have died and they do an autopsy and they um, take the brain and they reduce it to a slurry and look at how many, how many nuclei are in a liter of that, or it's probably a milliliter that they're looking at, and then figure out how big the slurry is and multiply it and you know how many brain cells we have. The human brain contains 86 billion neurons and weighs about the same as a great ape does, about 1,350 grams. That's how much their brain weighs. We do this for lots of different animals. A honeybee, tiny little thing, has 960,000, 960,000, but its brain is only one milligram. The rat has 200 million, and it weighs two grams, the brain of a rat. The dog has 160 million and weighs 72 grams, but it's not vegetarian. It eats meat, so it can handle a larger body and a larger head weight. The cat has 760 million, but it only weighs 36 grams. It's smaller, more compact. So I'm sorry, dog lovers. You always say dogs are smarter than cats. No, cats have so many more neurons than dogs do, and they're packed in really tight. Again, not a vegetarian. A dolphin, and that's not the fish dolphin, but the mammal, the porpoise dolphin, is 15 billion and weighs 1,600 grams, more than ours does. Now, again, not vegetarian. They are piscitarian. Uh, have any of you heard of the word piscitarian before? It comes from the, yes, some of you have. It comes from Pisces, and it's people who only eat fish as meat. They won't eat any other kind of meat. They only eat fish. That's a piscitarian. So dolphins are, are piscitarians. Uh, apes, then, 33 billion. 
we have 86 billion, they have 33 billion, but they're dispersed quite, quite a bit because they, that 33 billion fit in the same amount of space as ours does, 1,350 grams, and they are also vegetarian. And then the elephant really screws everything up. The elephant has 257 billion neurons, way more than we have, and it weighs more than we do, way more than we do, and its brain is heavier than ours is. They, can you imagine how, I mean, how, how they have to eat all day long, everywhere they go, and they're vegetarian on top of that, so they have to eat lots and lots to get the calories they need, and uh, we're destroying their jungles, and it's just a sad situation for elephants right now. If I take this mouse, it's made of plastic, and I heat it up, What's going to happen to the mouse plastic? I'll take all the guts out, just leave the plastic and heat it up. What's going to happen to the plastic? It will melt, yes. It will lose its shape, right? It loses its shape. And then if, if it's nice and hot, I can shape it into anything I want to, right? And when I shape it into something else and it cools down, it will maintain that shape. Yes, right. You don't maintain that shape unless I heat it up again. If I heat it up again, I can change its shape again. Well, it turns out that the brain is like plastic as a child. In its early years, it's hot plastic, hot plastic. It can be shaped into anything depending on the environmental influences that occur around it. So this is called the plasticity of the brain. If a person is born blind, they don't need the 25% of the occipital lobe in the back of their brain, so does it just die? No, it becomes part of the touch system so that when a person is reading Braille, the occipital lobe lights up as if they're seeing something. If you can't hear anything, if you're born deaf, then that area behind the ear Wernicke's area that's used for hearing and understanding speech, you don't need it. So does it just die? No, it becomes another, it has another purpose that's been given to it, which is why a lot of people say if you're born blind or you're born deaf, the other senses tend to take over. And that's true. Your brain starts to use that particular aspect of the brain for something else. So function of a particular part of your brain can change in the younger years. If you have a stroke, your left, hand, left side of your brain is for, is for speech. The left side of your brain is used for speech where the right side is not very much. In women, they use a little bit of the right side, but, and we'll talk about that in the sensation and perception chapter, but for men, it's all on the left side. If you have a stroke in the left side as a child, the right side takes over, man or female, doesn't matter, male or female, the right side becomes a part of the understanding of speech, hearing and recognizing speech. But if you're an adult and you lose the left side of your brain, the right side can take over for women because they already have part of the right side working, but for men, it will be a disaster. My sister had a stroke at 36. And she had it on the left side, and today she talks like this. But she can talk again. Men, because we don't use the right side of our brain to begin with. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> we don't use it for that purpose. Right? We have other things that we use the right side for. So. Uh, function can change, such as the occipital lobe for blind people activating when they read Braille, and the neurons can change connections as a result of learning as well, because as an adult, your brain is still changing, but it's changing based on learning at that point, and it's part of another part of the, of the uh, system, the hippocampus, and we'll talk about that in just a little while, too. So how do we know? You, know, uh, you can't, if you open up somebody's scalp, and look at their brain, it's just a blob, a jelly blob. It just, there's, it doesn't move, it doesn't change. You can't really see anything functioning in it. So how do we know when a brain is functioning properly? How do we know 
um, what it looks like. How do we look into a working brain without killing the subject of the experiment? How do we know what a properly functioning brain looks like and what do we know when there are issues with the brain? How do we know that? And there are newer and better things coming along all the time, but for us, let's talk about the EEG, which is the very first type of way of looking at the brain. Our brain is electrical in nature, so we can hook up a person with electrodes and we can actually see the signals going through, electrical signals going through the brain. And that gives us some really good information. It tells us when a person's awake. It tells us when a person is asleep, when they're daydreaming. There are five levels of sleep, and we'll, look, we'll talk about those in another chapter, in the consciousness chapter. But those, we can tell when a person is in that specific stages of sleep, except for the dream stage, that looks like they're awake. But there are other, other ways we can tell that the person is asleep, not awake at that point. But EEG gives us some pretty good ideas. But it's like, it's like Morse code dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 right SOS dot 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 dash 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 SOS we know somebody is in trouble but we don't know how much trouble we don't know what the trouble is we don't know how anxious they are about it it's just telling them there's somebody in trouble the same thing with EEG we can see certain aspects of what the brain is doing but we can't tell a whole lot from an EEG so the brain waves are patterns of electrical activity generated by the brain measured in amplitude and frequency, which is cycles per second. So how amplitude, how big, how much energy is going into it, and the cycles per second, how many times it cycles in one second. That's, and we'll talk more about that in other chapters as well. So that's a brain wave. But we don't see a whole bunch of information. We can't see what a person likes a cat or doesn't like a cat, right? But there are other ways to look at the brain as well. There are other brain scans we can use. So recording of the brain's electrical activity or bio, biochemical activity at specific sites can be done through brain scans. But for instance, the CT scan, the computerized CAT scan, um, computerized tomography, shows the structure of the brain. <laughs> and here we are again at um, structure and function. We're talking about Wilhelm, Wilhelm Wundt and William James and their argument over whether it's good to see the function of the brain or the structure of the brain. Well, with the structure, we can certainly see if there is a cancer growing in the brain, but we can't see if it's really working properly or not. The PET scan, positronic emission tomography, shows its function of the brain, so we need to connect the two of those together. We need to find a way to see the function and the structure at the same time, and the MRI can do that. Uh, the magnetic resonance imaging can show both function and structure, and there are newer and better types coming along all the time to see the brain in ways that we never thought of seeing the brain before. But the fMRI, the functional MRI, and the DTI, here's a picture of the DTI. This is, a, this is one single frame of a movie of the brain as it's thinking, as it's moving. We can put a person into a, a, a DTI machine and we can show them pictures of dogs and cats and guns and, uh, and knives and houses and other people and we can see how their brain reacts to all those pictures. So if, for instance, all of a sudden the amygdala lights up when we show them a picture of a cat, they might be fearful or of cats. It's possible. We don't know because the amygdala does other types of things as well besides fear and aggression. But we know something about that person because there's some sort of emotion tied to cats with that person. Now this picture, the, um, I don't know if you can see the orange is really good and the blues and the yellows, uh, but the orange is going uh, side to side and the yellow is going front to back. And the blue seems to be moving down and up is basically what it's doing. And there are other colors that it can have in it as well. But the DTI shows us where the electrical activity is occurring in the brain. You put a person into a, um, into a DTI and show them a picture of a cat. The very first thing that's going to light up is the occipital lobe because they're seeing a picture of the cat. Then it might move over to a memory area because they're remembering an uh, incident of a cat. 
and then the amygdala because they're afraid of cats. And we can actually watch it occur. And we'll have to actually, because electricity works really fast, we have to have a very good imaging system because we're going to have to take uh, a thousand pictures a second in order for it to really be the perfect view. But we do 32 or 64 frames per second instead of a thousand frames per second. But we're seeing a really good idea of how the brain actually functions and what people are thinking. And now let me blow your minds on this. So we can see this happening. And now we can hook a person up with electrodes all over their head in a, with a cap. And they have electrodes everywhere. And we say to them, the cap is connected to a computer. And we say to them, think the word cap. So the person thinks about the word cat, and the computer says cat. And this is happening right now at some of the major universities in the world, where people are starting to make computers that can read your mind. Now this is great for some people who are um, quadriplegic. They can't talk. They can't move. Their brain is in perfect shape, so we could put this thing on their brain and they can actually talk to people again through the computer. Does that blow your mind? Now, my problem with it is there are a lot of things I think that I hope no one ever hears. <laughs> and if you're thinking it, that computer is going to say it. So, you know, the, the um, ugly nurse comes in and you think, oh, God. And the computer says, oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, now it's not that perfect yet, but um, they, can actually, they can actually think in sentences, and the computer can spit out some of the words so that you get an idea of what is happening in their, in their thought processes. It isn't perfect yet, but I would bet in 50 years it will be. So the computer obviously has to be trained because it appears that every person is a little bit different, so that person will have had to actually have learned how to talk before they go deaf, before they but go mute, because uh, they have to be able, their brain has to already have been trained for certain words in certain ways for that particular brain. Not everybody's the same. So you would have to actually go through a training process then in that computer being hooked up to you and you, they give you a word and you think of that word and then it records it on the computer that this is the way the word looks in your brain and then the next word and the next and the next and the computer learns what your brain thinks is speech. So it's not like you could train it for one person and put it on somebody else and it would do it. It has to be trained per person at this point anyway. Mm -hmm. Is that cool? I think that's just cool. Like, that blows my mind, but I'm a biologist. Maybe it's only too cool to me. So here is a picture of a brain cut in half, the frontal portion of the brain, the back portion of the brain, and this is the right side of the brain. The left side has been removed, and you're looking in at the brain with a half of it gone. These are very important parts of the brain. I've already talked about the hypothalamus, and I said, Hypo means something below or something little when we were talking about hypothesis, right? Hypothesis, a little thesis. And I talked about the fact that the, hy that the um, hypothalamus is below and smaller than the thalamus is. And that's exactly what you see in this picture. Here is the thalamus and here is the hypothalamus, smaller and also below the thalamus. The pituitary gland is shown here because we're going to talk about it. It's called the master gland. It controls a lot of different aspects of the human body, including the endocrine system and the brain. The pons is part of what is known as the hind brain. The hind brain is very similar in all vertebrates. It seems to be almost identical in all vertebrates, and that's why studying mice tends to be useful in studying mice and rats, tend to be useful for us as human beings. The results do seem to look like they're correct for humans as well when we study these animals. The um, frontal lobe, this whole thing is called the uh, cerebral cortex, the cerebrum, 
uh, corpus callosum, I told you, we can cut the corpus callosum and you can't, the left side and the right side will not talk to each other anymore because everything the right side knows, the only reason the left side knows it is because it's been sent through the corpus callosum to, to let the left side know. And the left side, when it knows something, it sends the information to the right side. Well, if you have two different brains, it's called split brain person, they have two different brains in their system, one controlling the right side, one controlling the left side, and they don't always agree <laughs> on anything because they can't come to an agreement because they can't communicate with each other anymore. Uh, the medulla is down here, and right behind the medulla and coming up into the midbrain is what's called the reticular formation. The reticular formation wakes you up. Uh, when you're sleeping and keeps you awake while you're awake and if it shuts down you're a narcoleptic you fall asleep just like that as soon as it shuts down we don't know why the reticular formation in narcoleptics shut down but there are drugs that will help the reticular formation to stay active during the day so that they're driving along and they don't fall asleep while they're driving along obviously that would be really bad so that's um the uh, reticular formation. It's not shown in this particular frame. Uh, the, the cerebellum is really interesting because we don't really know why it's there. We know parts of why it's there. We know that the cerebellum is definitely connected with being on your feet, co co controlling your, um, your ability to walk, controlling your hand-eye movements. It keeps you in line and um, when you lose the cerebellum, you'll die. But also, you lose a lot of your coordinated efforts at that point. You lose coordination. And uh, we'll talk more about that in another chapter, but right now I want to tell you the difference. I, the, the difference between the cerebellum and the rest of the brain. The entire brain has a certain amount of neurons in it, 86 billion. The majority of those are in the cerebellum. The cerebellum has more neurons in it than the rest of the brain together. So it can't just be coordination. There's got to be other things associated with it. And we do know that it's involved in learning. And many also say that it is involved in your habits. When you do something over and over and over again, it develops a program, basically, a habit of doing that thing. It's written into the cerebellum. When you activate the beginning of that program, it runs through that program. That's a habit. And that's why habits are so hard to break, because it's programmed into your brain now in the cerebellum. I say a lot of you have like donuts. I don't know anyone who doesn't like donuts, but there are different types of donuts. Uh, there's the Krispy Kreme, really fluffy, um, glazed donuts. You know what I'm talking about? Krispy Kreme glazed donuts? Okay. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some of us love that. I'm addicted to sugar, and that's just sugar heaven right there. Um, they, it's, you know what liposuction is, where you take out the fat on your body? Um, they suck the fat out. They say that Krispy Kreme donuts, they just go straight into the fat in your body, just whoosh right into the fat. It's the opposite of liposuction. But there's another type of donut, an old-fashioned donut, and they're very thick and heavy. You know what I'm talking about? They're, 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 cake, they're almost a cake, a, a cupcake rather than a donut. Are you familiar with those as well? Okay. So I see a lot of yeses. So I like to, this is the way that you can remember this. The cerebellum is an old-fashioned cake. I mean, it is thick. But the rest of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the cerebrum, it's a fluffy glazed donut. It's just, it, it, it's really squishy and jelly-like. Right? So it's not like the cerebellum. The cerebellum is very different. We're not sure yet all the functions of cerebellum, but many people are convinced it does more than what we know it does at this point. Does that help? I hope in uh, remembering the differences between the two. Cerebrum is the top part. Cerebellum is the bottom part. Cerebellum. So the 
The hindbrain, I just talked a little bit about, contains the brain stem, pons, medulla, reticular formation, cerebellum. The pons links the spinal cord and the brain to each other and regulates the brain's activity during sleep. The medulla regulates heart rate and breathing. You would, you, so the medulla and the pons and the medulla are both connected to the autonomic nervous system, the things that we do automatically, right? Uh, breathing, regular heart rate, right? The reticular formation is involved in maintaining consciousness. And when you go to sleep, it, it helps to wake you up from sleep and alert you that there's incoming data. So it actually tells that there's information coming from the body into the brain. It tells the brain, hey, wake up. There's something going on about to come into you. So it's uh, when it goes to sleep, when the reticular formation, it should never shut down. It should never shut down. It's, it gets less intensity for you to go to sleep, and then it pops back up again, but it doesn't shut down. If it shuts down, you have narcolepsy. You fall asleep at the snap of a finger and um, at inappropriate times. Anybody who has seen uh, the movie Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo knows uh, there was a woman in that movie that fell asleep while she was bowling, and she and the ball hit the alley at the same time. Whoa! <laughs> so the cerebellum regulates motor control, we know that, motor coordination, posture, balance, and um, many different studies are showing that it also has an effect with memory as well. The limbic system is considered layer number two. Uh, the limbic system is involved in explicit long-term memory, and there are two men, Nadal and Moscovich, who have proposed a theory called the multiple memory trace theory that says that the hippocampus is permanently involved in the retention of and the retrieval of long-term episodic memory. And when we get to memory, we'll talk about three different types of memory. Episodic memory, semantic memory, and procedural memory. Procedural memory is the things that you know how to do, the, the, the mechanical things you know how to do. You know how to cut a, night, a, a piece of steak. You know how to chew. You know how to ride a bicycle. These are things that are mechanical, procedural, that you know how to do, procedural memory. Semantic memory is your knowledge of facts and figures. That's semantic memory. Episodic memory is the episodes of your life. We'll talk more about it when we get into the memory system, but I, 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 my ring tells me that I'm married. But that's just knowledge. That's just I'm married. But I remember the episode. I remember everything about getting married, walking down the aisle with my wife the first time, you know, standing up there watching her come down with her father. Um, <laughs> um, she was at the doorway. Me and my cousin were standing up there waiting for her to walk down, and her father bends over and he whispers something into her ear, and she laughed. <laughs> she was giggling all the way down the aisle. She was giggling. And I asked her later, what did your father say to you before, the mar before we got married? And she said, he told me if I wanted to be anywhere else, he would take me there right now. <laughs> so he, he was giving her a way out. <laughs> and uh, of course, 26 years later, we're still married. So I guess it was a good thing she said, yeah, I just keep going down the aisle. So they, this is the semantic memories. This is semantic memories that make your life really something. It makes it worthwhile. The knowledge is just knowledge, but the episode of, that, of how you got to that knowledge is what really gives it life. And unfortunately, episodic memory is the very first to go in Alzheimer's disease. And in other um, types of dementia, um, episodic memory is very weak. And we'll talk in the memory system about a man who had a disease that destroyed his hippocampus, totally destroyed his hippocampus. And it's 40 years on now since he had that, and he wakes up every day and thinks it's 40 years ago because he can't put down any new memories, none. Since that time that his hippocampus is destroyed, he has replaced no new memories, none. And um, we'll talk about him when we get to the memory chapter. So episodic is the first to go in Alzheimer's disease and in vascular dementia. And then we have the amygdala in the limbic system, controls emotions like aggression and fear and the formation of emotional memories. Emotional memories are easy to remember, way easier to remember than others because they're associated in the brain with some pattern. And so you can remember them, especially when 
you're angry, you can remember things that happen when you're angry. You, when you're sad, you can remember sad things. And when you're happy, you can remember happy things easier. So if you, if you lesion an a, a amygdala, cut it so that it's not working properly, you get a decrease in aggression in that particular animal. And if you lesion the amygdala in cats, then you get an excessively tame cat. But if you stimulate, put an electrode into the amygdala and stimulate it, the amyg you get a cat that looks like it's really pissed off. It's hissing, it's, get a, it's, it's all, its hair is all fluffed out, you know, its ears are back. So we, look, we can say that it looks like it's very difficult to give animals human characteristics, but it looks like it's angry. <laughs> and if you do this to a rat, if you put a rat in a cage and put a, a cat on the other side of a piece of glass from the cage, the rat's going to be cowering in the corner. But if you put a, a stimulation in its amygdala, it's going to attack that cat. It's, the rat will attack a cat because you've stimulated its amygdala. And of course, if you stimulate the right areas, it gets fearful instead of aggressive. So it's really, uh, an amygdala is multiple different types of emotions. The hypothalamus is involved in regulating body temperature, hunger, thirst, and emotions, and sex. The hypothalamus is an interesting thing for me and my family because my stepfather is what's known as an atomic soldier. Uh, he's a Marine. There's a gunny sergeant. Uh, that's about as high as you can get in the NCOs. And when he was younger in the Marines, they took his platoon and put him on a destroyer and parked the, the destroyer out at sea one mile off of an island called Christmas Island and then blew up a thermonuclear device on the island to see what it would do to the destroyer and all the people that were on it. Now, when they did this, they were wearing very, very dark glasses, the kind you can see through and look at the sun without burning your eyes, very dark glasses. And before the um, bomb went off, they were told to put their hands over their eyes and close their eyes. So they had their eyes were closed, they had on these dark glasses, and they had their hands over their eyes. And he said when the bomb went off, he could see the bones in his hand. That's how bright it was. And then there was a rope behind them that they were told, put your arms around the rope and hold on, because then that wind came whoosh and pushed the ship over, and then it came back up again, but it wasn't that part that they were holding on for because as the mushroom cloud went up, it pulled them off the ship. So they were holding on to it because the wind was pulling them up into that mushroom cloud as well, one mile away. And he said it was the most frightening thing he had ever seen in his life. And it was also the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. He said he, he saw colors in that mushroom cloud that you just don't see otherwise because it's eating up everything. And when fire burns up a particular element, it burns in a different color depending on the element that it's burning. He said there were just gorgeous colors, absolutely beautiful colors. And why did they do this? To find out how, how well a group of um, soldiers would do if you dropped an atomic bomb a mile away on their enemy. Now, they were given shore leave as soon as it was all over. They were given shore leave, but they're here at Christmas Island, and the bomb had gone off. And so half of them um, took the shore leave, and they went ashore, and they, they swam, and they had a good time. They had a great time. All of them died from radiation poisoning. And the other ones, like my stepfather, went down into the bunks and either went to sleep or played cards or did something else. But they were then protected by the metal of the ship from any of the radiation that was falling out of the sky. And um, they did have issues. And my, my stepfather cannot regulate his body temperature. His hypothalamus will, is just not working right. So he, he's always freezing cold, always freezing cold. And um, <laughs> we, we tease him. Like when the lights go out, we say, where's Bob? We need some light. Like he glows, right? <laughs> He's radioactive, um, and he isn't. He's not radioactive, and he doesn't glow. But um, we tease him about it. And he stayed in the military for many, many more years. He went to Vietnam. He had 
three tours of duty in Vietnam. He was a sniper, one of the best, and he was behind enemy lines almost the entire time he was in Vietnam. Uh, and then they told him he was going for a fourth, and he said, no, you put me in a desk or I'm retiring because I'm not going back. And so he retired um, as a gunny sergeant. Now, they did, uh, those soldiers had eventually got compensation for what happened to them, but a military does all kinds of strange things to its people uh, in the search for true scientific knowledge. So, the, and, and that's why we have independent review boards today, <laughs> so that people can say, no, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you won't, no, that's wrong. You can't do that to, to human beings. Um, now, you might be able to do it to a, a, you know, a orangutan and a, and a great ape or a chimpanzee, but you can't do that to humans. So, hypothalamus, we've just talked about. We also talked about the amygdala and talked about hippocampus. So, those are the, th the three big things in the brain limbic system. And now we get to the top part of the brain, the cerebrum, the topmost layer of the brain, the bulbous cap that's over the brain. Remember that the midbrain, the, the hindbrain is almost identical in all vertebrates. All vertebrates have the same hindbrain basically. But the limbic system and the upper part of the brain, the cerebrum, are different in different animals and, uh, and maybe that's one of the things that makes us so different than the rest of the animals is because of our cerebrum um, and because of how many different 86 billion neurons we have, whereas the great apes have only 33. So the cerebral uh, cortex is a thin gray matter covering of the cerebrum, carries on our thinking, perceiving, judgments, and, and it controls our emotions as well. Uh, cerebral hemispheres, here's a picture of it right here, right? It, and I purposely made it small so that it looks like, I mean, have you ever opened up a walnut and looked at the walnut, which if you haven't cracked it all the way and smashed it, it looks like, that's what it looks like. It looks like a walnut. So the, the two walnut-shaped halves of the cerebrum that are connected together by the corpus callosum. The cerebrum enables reasoning, planning, creating, problem-solving, higher cognitive functions, and it's the largest mass of the brain. Uh, the cortex is the outermost part of the cerebrum. Uh, cortex comes from the Latin word meaning shell or bark. Uh, cerebrum is divided into two halves connected by the corpus callosum that allows them to talk to each other. And the surface area of the brain is way larger than what we could fit into our brain, into our scalp and head, than if it was blown up like a balloon. So it's folded on top of each other, folded off together. So it has all this surface area, but they're in fissures, right? There is one major fissure, the central sulcus, which is the same in every single person. And then all the rest of the, the folds are different. Almost, people say, like a thumbprint. So scientists believe that if you could take a picture of your brain's folds, it would say, this is you, because no one else would have it, like your thumbprint. No one else would have the same type of folds. The two important areas in the frontal lobe is the uh, antumpal lobe is Broca and Wernicke's area. Broca is in the frontal lobe. Wernicke's is in the temporal lobe. Uh, Broca was a, was a medical doctor, and he specialized in people who had a problem talking, which is called aphasia. They're unable to produce the, a proper sentence. When they can think it, they know they're thinking it properly, but when it tries to come out of their mouth, it just comes out in various words, and it, there's no connection. And I don't even have to think about what I'm saying to you. It's just a flow stream of consciousness. That's all it is. So these people couldn't do that, called aphasia. And when they died, he did autopsies on them, and he found out they all had the same problem in their brain. One part of their brain was broken, had, had dead, was dead fibers. And that area today is called Broca's area, and it's found to be the center for speech used to translate thoughts into speech. Wernicke had the opposite problem. He had patients who would, who would listen to what you were saying, but it sounded like gobbledygook to them. They couldn't get what you were saying talking to them. If you wrote it down, they could read it, and they knew what it was by reading it, but they couldn't hear. They, I mean, they heard 
but what they heard was just junk. So when his patients died, he did autopsies on them and found a particular area. Now they're only 20 years apart, these two. They were basically born in the same time frame. And they're the first two people who have proved that the brain had a purpose. What was the purpose of the brain before that? No one really knew. Why, the, why do we have a brain? What does it do? Obviously, it does something because without it, we're not working. So it does something, but uh, what kind of things does it do? And they proved, the first two people, to prove this is the actual reason this part of the brain exists, Broca and Wernicke's area. And you can see them in this particular picture here. This is the Broca area in the frontal lobe. This is Wernicke's in the temporal lobe. So what is the frontal lobe here? Look, watch the cursor goes across this whole thing right here is the frontal lobe. This is part is called the prefrontal cortex, and then it goes all the way through the, the light blue cyan and up through the middle of the cyan and the purple over to the back area. So the mo part called motor, which is the motor cortex, is connected to the frontal lobe. The somatosensory cortex is connected to the parietal lobe, which is this upper portion right here. And then the occipital lobe is back here, and the temporal lobe is right here. This is the temporal lobe. Right, so the back of the temporal lobe is where you find Wernicke's area, and the back of the frontal lobe is where you find Broca's area. But then you have the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex, extremely important areas. The motor cortex, if a person is in surgery, and I've already told you this, if a person's surgery, they can, brain surgery, they can be awake during brain surgery because there's no pain associated with anything that happens in the brain. Yeah, so why do we get migraines? It's actually the muscles that are associated with it, the scalp that are causing you pain. It's not the brain itself. So we open up a person's brain, they're still awake, and we can touch little areas of the brain with an electrode that has a little electrical charge in it. And when it does touch a neuron, it fires off that neuron because it's like the neuron's been activated. So we fire off a neuron and a little and a finger moves. Oh, that's the finger. That's this finger. We fire off another one and oh, the thumb moves. That's the thumb. Uh, we fire off another one and their and their nose twitches. That's where that particular part of the motor cortex is. And we can map the entire motor cortex, and it turns out no matter how many people they've mapped, thousands and thousands of people they've mapped, we're the same. There's no difference in the motor cortex. We are all one race, the human race. There is no such thing as breaking us up by color of skin or um, by the slant of our eyes or whatever else. We are human beings, all of us, and there's little tiny pieces of the genetics that have changed here and there. Um, there's actually one gene in the millions of genes that we have that causes our skin to change color. One gene, that's it. We can't say that it's a different race of people simply because of one gene. We're all human beings. We're one race. Uh, the somatosensory cortex, if we touch that, person will go, oh, somebody just touched my cheek. Nobody did. But we touch the part of the, of the brain that is associated with somebody touching your cheek or touching your hand or scratching your back or tickling your foot. So we can go through that and map that as well. And again, everybody is the same. The place for your lips is the same place as where my lips are on somatosensory cortex. Here's an interesting part, and I'll finish up with this one because we've got four minutes left. Lose your arm. Your arm is gone. You no longer have an arm, but you feel like somebody's touching your arm because the somatosensory cortex, where the arm used to be, is for that particular arm. The somatosensory cortex for the part for that arm has been activated by something. And so you feel like somebody touched your arm there's no, there's no one there. There's no arm to touch. And that's called phantom limb pain because it's mostly associated with pain. There's, an, there's still an arm place in your brain even if you've lost your arm. And the motor cortex, there's still a motor cortex for the arm. Even though there's nothing there to move, the motor cortex still has that location. And if I put electrode 
in the motor cortex for the arm that you lost, I can connect it to a robotic arm and you can think about moving your arm and your arm will move. That robotic arm will move. And they're doing that kind of stuff today in laboratories. They're connecting cyborg, you know, if we call them cyborgs, where they're humans, but they have bodies that are made up of um, pieces of metal and electronics. And today, they still have to connect that particular piece into the motor cortex right where that arm is and have a wire that comes down through the scalp through the, to that particular location. But pretty soon, they're going to be doing it by Bluetooth. It'll, you'll just, I mean, <laughs> um, Elon Musk just, just did a demonstration with a pig where he had put something into the pig's brain and was able to control the pig. That, it's coming. It is coming. That should blow your brains out too right there. I mean, um, this is an amazing, this, this is why I got into biology and psychology. It's just, this is amazing stuff. All right, if you did not type your name and say, I'm here, make sure you do so. And uh, other than that, unless you want to stay around to talk or ask questions, I'm done. Have a great weekend. Stay healthy, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.